Welcome to Afternoon Briefing on day one of the election campaign. I'm Greg Jennett. And I'm Frank Kelly, joining you from Parliament House on Ngunnawal Country. Well, Scott Morrison has long gone from the nation's capital, that's for sure. He started today on the New South Wales south coast in the Labor-held marginal seat of Gilmore, while Anthony Albanese is in Tasmania's north. Here's a quick snapshot of life on the trail on day one. Prorogued the Parliament from 9.29am on the 11th of April 2022 until Saturday, the 21st of May 2022. This is where the magic happens. Yes, yes. yes here they are. It's good, doesn't it? <laughs> Morrison, he was in Honolulu enjoying himself. That looks seriously cool. Yeah, well, colour and movement, Fran. Uh, we, Selfies galore, Greg, throughout this <laughs> we campaign. We expected it, and day one certainly delivered. But there's a bit of policy to examine, too, behind some of that colour, because if economic management's to be a central issue in this election, then some mastery of the key economic figures, you'd think, would be rather helpful. The unemployment rate nationally might be one, and another might be the official interest rate set by the Reserve Bank. Well, Anthony Albanese got hit with with the double whammy today on those by the travelling media pack. It's up to people to ask whatever questions they want. Um, Andrew. What's the national unemployment rate? National unemployment rate at the moment uh, is, uh, I think it's 5.4, uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Mr Albanese, Mr Albanese, can we ask Senator Gallagher, your Shadow Finance Minister, some questions? Sure. Shadow Finance Minister, do you know what the unemployment rate is, what the Reserve Bank current rate is? Uh, the Reserve Bank current rate is um, 0.1 uh, and the unemployment rate's at 4%. Yeah, maybe it Ouch. pays to be a shadow, <laughs> a shadow finance minister. Thank goodness Katie Gallagher had the figures at her fingertips, Fran. But really, it's unbelievable, as Gaff goes, to uh, get yourself tangled in this one on day one. Oh, this is a pretty bad gaff because it plays straight into Scott Morrison's key narrative about Al Anthony Albanese, that you can't trust him with the economy. He's going on a lot about, you know, a while ago they were calling him a L-plate leader, that kind of thing. You know, Scott Morrison makes the point of he's overseen as Treasurer and Prime Minister, eight budgets. Anthony Albanese hasn't done one. Well, lo and behold, Anthony Albanese kind of proved that today when he just did not know that number. And I don't think, you know, yes, these are gotcha questions. I think earlier the pack had asked him what's the unemployment rate in Tasmania. Well, can't expect them to know that. But no. the national rate, I mean, Greg, the difference between 5.4% and 4% is about 190,000 people on the unemployment queues, I think. Right. Someone who wants to be leader should really be a bit more mindful of that, I think. Yeah, it's not only the fact that it hadn't sort of settled in his consciousness, it's that the government's been telegraphing it at every opportunity. It's yes. basically their campaign pitch, isn't it? Right, right through budget week, but even before that, I think they were straight out of the gate at the start of this year, talking about an aspiration mm. to get unemployment with a three in front of it. Um, we didn't even get that close from Anthony Albanese. Like, we didn't get a 3.9 or a 3.8. No, no, no. He was no. out by quite a whack. It was out by a lot, as I but say. But le legitimate, <laughs> legitimate questions, not, not gotcha questions, do you reckon, Fran? Well, I think legitimate. Like I said, I mean, I think, yes, you can't expect uh, the national leader to know Tasmania's unemployment rate off the top of his yeah, head. But sure. the national rate, with everything you've said, we've had the Reserve Bank saying it could come down, start with a three. You know, I think he, I mean, he absolutely should have known that and he, and he, he, he knew that he should have known it, didn't uh, he? Well, he sure face. did, as did his campaign team that, let's face it, are paid to have the antennae mm. attuned to such problems. They knew they had one on their hands right here. So after the very next event, which was a community morning tea in Launceston, came the clean-up operation. 
Earlier today, I made a mistake. I'm human. But when I make a mistake, I'll fess up to it and I'll set about correcting that mistake. I won't blame someone else. I'll accept responsibility. That's what leaders do. Do you know what the figures are? Yes, yeah, 0.1 is the cash rate, which is very different from the interest rate that people pay, of course, and 4% is the unemployment rate. Yeah, take two. Now. <laughs> take two after the original rehearsal. Uh, he certainly got it right that time. Uh, I suppose, Fran, if there was ever a time to make a mistake and then to own up for it, it's day one. This is also part of his political persona, isn't it? This idea that I will take on and own mistakes. Well, yeah, not so much his personal persona, but in contrast to the Prime Minister, who Labor for a long time had been critiquing as always trying to blame everybody else. You know, they've made ads about, I don't hold a hose, mate, or it's not my job it's not my job. So they're trying to turn this back and say, well, at least Anthony Albanese is the kind of leader who will, you know, take shoulder the blame and own up and take responsibility and trying to make a positive out of that negative. But, you know, Greg, the problem for Anthony Albanese is that even before he got tight, got the chance to make that up, so to speak, the Libs were out there with the ad. Sorry. I, I'm not sure what it is. I, I'm not sure what it is. I, I'm not sure what it is. All right, so very nimble. Uh, I know it's quick and dirty. Anyone could make that ad this on... This campaign will be quick and dirty. I think that's the whole <laughs> point. And, and Labor really needs to make sure, you know, they don't have anything like this again. If Anthony Albanese makes any many more of these kind of mistakes, people will think he's an L plate leader. Yeah, and there's a bit of signalling there as a machine that the Libs are going to be as quick as they can on mm. the turnaround, Fran. Yep. Greg, thousands of kilometres will be travelled by the leaders over the next six weeks. Many of them will be racked up by Barnaby Joyce, travelling through seats that the Nats hold or are aiming to win. Yeah, so uh, that is true. We managed to t catch up with the Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals leader, Anthony Albanese, a little earlier. He was standing on a bridge right above the Murray River. Barnaby Joyce, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. You're off and running on what's called the Wombat Trail. I was going to ask, uh, where does that take you? Quite literally, it puts you in New South Wales and Victoria right now. Queensland as well, I guess. Is that the extent of it? Well, here we are in the Cedar Nichols at the, uh, um, the Mayamachuca Bridge, which is a massive investment, over $300 million. And, um, yeah, of course, you've got to represent the whole nation. This is an election about the nation, not an election about just Sydney or just Melbourne. And we've got to make sure the whole of the nation, which is vitally important for the export earning dollars. Remember, eight of your ten biggest exports come from regional areas. And if you don't have money that comes in, then all the things you wear, look at your shirt, your strides, your tie, your car, the fuel in your car, all that stuff comes in from overseas and somebody somewhere has got to be putting something on the boat, sending in the other direction and that's regional Australia and that's where we are right now. And is there a broad understanding, Barnaby Joyce, with your coalition partners that you won't be working uh, the metropolitan or outer metropolitan areas, you will stick to the regional wombat trap? I think everybody's got their job to do and I'm talking to you now, I'm sure that goes into metropolitan areas but you know, quite obviously uh, I've got to make sure that in regional areas we win regional seats and I, you know, we've done that in the past. We've done that by reason of delivery. What I'm going to take you to a question of the day, in fact the question of the day, Barnaby Joyce, what's the national unemployment rate? Well, the national unemployment rate is currently around about 4% and we're looking forward in the forward estimates to it going below 4%. Youth unemployment is below 10% and that's one of the first times. This is a record low unemployment rate and takes us back decades before we get to a period of time where the unemployment rate was as low. It's a sign of good economic management. We've been so lucky compared to other countries. We've come out of this recession so well. Just the other one to cover the field because it is a question that's being popped to leaders all over. The official or yeah. overnight cash interest rate, where's that sitting presently? Um, well, as an account, you're asking me the right questions as an accountant, right? Um, it's one of the record lows. It's apparently at uh, 10 basis points, 0.1 of a percent. Yeah. And this is uh, remarkably low. Uh, and I wouldn't suggest for one second it would stay there. Now, it is predicted that we're facing a very personality-based, even presidential campaign in the weeks ahead. Some even say a dirty one. Set against that backdrop, 
You'd be bracing yourself, wouldn't you, Barnaby Joyce, for some of your text messages to reappear in ALP advertising. You fully prepared for that? Well, that means that it's an arg argument in a hominem campaign and not one of policy and not one of delivery. And, uh, you know, it's very political and very clever, but it's, it's not really showing proper respect to where the nation is. Uh, going back to something that's sort of a private message between two people and saying, wow, that's our policy which we're putting forward before the Australian people goes to show there's not a great depth in what is uh, the alternate form of government. But the character card's being played by both sides, isn't it, to be fair? Well, what I can say is in my uh, workings with Scott Morrison, he's honoured every agreement that we've ever undertaken. So I find him a, a person that I can trust and a person of conviction, and uh, that's what matters. My working relationship with him as the Deputy Prime Minister, and he, the Prime Minister, has been one of respect, diligence and outcome. And do you have a strategy to counter the liar and hypocrite text messages if, in fact, they are used against you? Well, I will acknowledge that that will be basically the, the, the arrow that will be cast by people who don't want to go into the substance and detail of the alternate forms of government, and people will read it for what it is. I'll say an ad hominem comment from uh, a shallow perspective. Now, let's ask you, Barnaby, about the starting position as measured by the polls. News poll has the coalition's vote stuck around 36%. Uh, the Resolve poll in the nine newspapers uh, slightly worse when it comes to some regional readings in WA and Queensland. Do either of those accord with what you're picking up on the ground? Well, I, I just respect the people at the ballot box that they'll make a decision. The Australian people are not stupid. You know, there are a lot of people who make up their mind literally on the day in the ballot box. And, yeah, and to that uh, end, you have we'll $20 billion dollars to campaign with, much of it infrastructure in regional areas. Uh, that's specifically designed to close the gap, isn't it? Well, specifically designed to make us as strong as possible. If you look at that, in the Pilbara, iron ore, our greatest exports, when, the, when Port Hedland closes down, our dollar goes down. Uh, Townsville, Bundaberg with sugar, Gladstone, major export, export uh, port, uh, the Hunter Valley in Newcastle. What we're doing there is, is not parochial because a lot of those seats, like the Northern Territory's Labor, the other ones are Liberal. Now, were you aware that Alan Tudge was still in the Cabinet? Uh, well, he's not been paid a Cabinet salary and he's been stood aside and the only people who can remove him completely of course are the people in his electorate and I'll let them make that decision. I personally think he was doing a very good job. Are you comfortable with taxpayers paying 500, probably upwards of $600,000 in legal settlement and costs to Rochelle Miller, bearing in mind that there was no technical breach of the ministerial code by Alan Touch? Well, that's a decision by the Department of Finance which is at arm's length to any minister, so uh, I, I'm not going to question the integrity and independence of the Department of Finance. They're, they're, they, you know, they're, they're very professional bureaucrats. You set a standard yourself in 2018. Uh, you made a clean break, resigning your leadership and your ministerial position. Why? I mean, are you frustrated that that example hasn't been followed in this case? Well, that, that was my choice. Um, I think it was incumbent on me, me as the leader at that stage to give my party. Uh, a, a capacity to deal with something that I think, to be quite honest, there was a lot of a sort of ad hominem position in the attack on me. I don't want to replicate that. Um, there were things that were definitely my fault. Let's not be judge, ju judge, jury and sentencer before we know all the details on other issues pertinent to um, to Mr. Touch. All right. Now, just finally, let's wind forward to the end of this campaign. The relationship between uh, the Libs and Nats hasn't always been uh, a happy one or a comfortable one throughout this term in government. If unsuccessful, do you see any circumstances in which the Nats would not renew their coalition agreement in opposition? Uh, incredibly unlikely, almost impossible, but uh, we are two different parties. And as you know, from time to time, on rare occasions, we do uh, basically follow our, our path, which we, we think is best for regional Australia. Uh, and so that you is, leave that, that open? Right as a separate party. No, I know what you're getting at, Greg. Uh, no, we're going to this election as a coalition. There's no chance of getting to the other side and having two different parties. OK. But what we always do is that time to time, if required, uh, through a 
through the process of Parliament, if we have a different view, maybe on issues, um, I know, pertinent to things that are important around here, such as water, um, that you know, we, we express our views. We've got about six now, weeks of campaigning uh, to get through before uh, any of those hypotheticals might remotely kick in. Barnaby Joyce, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome, Greg. Now, it almost goes without saying that all eyes have been fixed on Anthony Albanese today, but that doesn't mean he carries all of Labor's campaign alone on his shoulders. No, Frank. same with both sides. Fellow front benches will fan out across the other states. For Labor, the Shadow Education Minister, Tanya Plibersek, is in Brisbane. Tanya Plibersek, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Great to be with you. You're in the electorate of Bowman, which is a very safe Liberal seat of the margin of 10.2%. You've been in other safe Liberal seats today, Ryan, with a margin of 6 points, Brisbane 4.9 points. Are you dreaming or do you know something the rest of us don't? Well, I've just been with Labor's fantastic candidate for Bowman, Denisha Duff, and uh, I've been, as you say, during the day campaigning with other terrific Labor candidates. We're very um, focused on the election six weeks away. We know that it is uh, going to be a tough campaign, but that doesn't mean that the people of Brisbane don't want to hear from Labor, no matter where they live, no matter which part of Brisbane they're living in. Uh, and I can tell you, Fran, that it doesn't matter where I go, the thing that people keep raising with me is that under Scott Morrison, life's getting harder, not easier. Uh, everything's going up but their wages. People constantly raise with me that the cost of living's increased, petrol, childcare, rent, uh, groceries are all going up and wages just aren't keeping pace with that. Uh, that's a big focus for people. And I, I have to say, in Brisbane, um, I, I've been really interested to see that people continue to raise issues like integrity with me, uh, the fact that this Prime Minister promised a, a integrity commission, a federal integrity commission with teeth. He's never delivered that. Uh, and of course, people continue to raise the fact that um, after, you know, almost a decade in government, this uh, this mob still don't have a, an energy and climate change policy that, that they're prepared to stick to. Sure, but after 10 years, this mob is still in government and news polls today has the two-party preferred gap closing uh, to six points, which is almost exactly as it happened in 2019. Uh, that's what happened to Labor's lead. Are you having deja vu? You're feeling a little bit sick in your stomach as you saw that today? Well, I didn't take anything for granted in the last election and I don't take anything for granted this election either. We've got uh, a great leader in Anthony Albanese. We've got a strong, united, disciplined, experienced team. We've got great policies. We've got great candidates. But, you know, politics is a very uncertain business, Fran, and so we'll be working, all of us, every day to make sure that we talk to Australians about the, the better vision for Australia that we have. We know that people say under Scott Morrison life's getting harder. They tell me constantly that Scott Morrison's not there when you need him, that as soon as the going gets tough he goes missing. Uh, but, you know, we can't rely on that. We need to be making sure that Australians understand we've got a, a plan for a strong economy, we've got a plan for good Aussie jobs here in Australia, well, a let's future talk made about in jobs. Australia. Let's talk about jobs. Let's go back to basics. Do you know what the unemployment rate is? Well, it, it's about 4% nationally, but I'm in Queensland, so it's 4.3% here. But Fran, Should look, Anthony Albanese it, have known that today? Test. Yeah, but hang on, that's a bad well, gap for he, Labor, he, isn't it, who's campaigning on jobs and secure he, work to get the unemployment rate so badly wrong? Yeah, you know what? Uh, Anthony has already said today that he should have known and he made a mistake. But I'll tell you this, Fran. Um, elections aren't memory tests. They're tests of leadership. And if you want to talk about unemployment, let's talk about unemployment and underemployment. Uh, Australians all over the country are saying they need to work two or three or four jobs because they can't find a permanent full-time job that allows them to support their family. We've got a, a million Australians who'd like more hours of work who can't get them under Scott Morrison. We've got a government that voted against criminalising wage theft. Labor has a plan. 
to make sure that we criminalise wage theft and that if two people are doing the same job, they get the same pay. We don't want to see dodgy labour hire firms undercutting permanent work. We need to do something about the gig economy. We know that people have been ripped off and exploited in the gig economy. Yeah, but Tanya, we still have a gender pay gap. We've got a plan to deal with the gender pay gap. And this is what policy. matters in the world of work. It is what matters, but it also, in, in order for you to be able to implement those policies, you've got to win the election. Day one of the campaign, your leader has made a bad mistake. What did you think when you heard what happened today? I thought that election campaigns are tests of leadership, not tests of memory. And uh, the difference between Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese is Anthony Albanese says, yeah, fair cop, I should have known, let's move on. That, okay. that is the difference. Scott Morrison, Scott Morrison would have someone else to blame. It would be a state premier's fault or I don't hold a hose, mate, or sorry, I'm off overseas right now. Uh, times are getting tough. And that is the difference. Uh, I think in a test of leadership, Anthony has very clearly shown that he's the better leader today. Uh, his gaffe, though, overshadowed the fact that the Prime Minister has committed uh, that Alan Tudge will remain in his Cabinet as Education Minister. This is despite the fact that uh, Alan Tudge has stood aside at the moment from the Ministry. Also, the fact that the Finance Department, we now know, has negotiated a settlement of half a million dollars with a former staffer of Alan Tudge, with whom he had an intimate relationship. Is that appropriate if there's a half a million dollar payout for this, minute, for this man to be in the Cabinet? Yeah, well, we know the standard that Scott Morrison expects of his Cabinet ministers. Uh, I mean, what we found out today is that... Uh, that under this government, you do the wrong thing, you get promoted. Well, I mean, the, uh, but the Prime Minister Prime made the Minister... point he got cleared by an inquiry. He was not found to be in breach of ministerial standards. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, OK. He also <laughs> said he's not privy to <laughs> well, the negotiations Fred. between the Finance Department and, and Ms Miller. OK, well, here's two points, Fran. Uh, he got cleared by an inquiry in, in which the complainant didn't participate because she didn't believe in the process. And if... He didn't do anything wrong. Why are we spending half a million dollars plus of taxpayers' money on this? Like, he either did something wrong and there's a liability or he did nothing wrong. Why are we spending half a million bucks of and taxpayers' money on it if he did nothing wrong? That's an important question, isn't it? Do you can think you, the can detail... you answer that, Well, I was just going to yeah. ask you, do you think the details of this uh, compensation payout with or this negotiated settlement with the Finance Department and Ms Miller should be made public then? I think the complainant has a right to some privacy. She's obviously been, uh, you know, treated pretty badly if she doesn't have faith in the process that the Prime Minister set up to deal with this. Um, but I think it's really up to the government to explain. You, ca you cannot have it both ways. You can't have the Prime Minister saying, nothing to see here, nothing was done wrong. Uh, um, Minister Tudge can go back, you know, into a senior cabinet position. You can't say, nothing to see here, but by the way, we're going to spend 500 thousand dollars plus of taxpayers money I, I don't see how those two things can coexist and and fran i'd be very interested if any journalist can get an answer from the prime minister on that point tanya plibersek thank you very much for joining us thanks fran so. Right. Well, it is clear that some of us are hampered by our lack of knowledge here. We can ask the questions, Fran, but none of us are particularly knowledgeable about the circumstances that have led to the payment, let alone uh, the return post an election of Alan Tudge. Yeah, no, that's the issue there. As Tanya Plibersek said, Ms Miller did not uh, cooperate. She did not give evidence to the, uh, the Vivian Tom inquiry. I think that was the legal advice. Um, she had alleged bullying. The minister has denied that. Um, it's obviously about work conditions, but we do not know if they relate to Mr Tudge or somebody else. But the fact is, it's half a million dollars of taxpayers' money and the Minister is going to be back in Cabinet. We've got that confirmed. So, you know, I think there are some questions that need yeah, a bit of clarity. Legitimate questions. Why don't we actually hear from Scott Morrison himself? He's been trying to explain today that Alan Tudge never officially tendered his resignation. He's merely stood aside for, well, let's face it, what is now an extended period of time. There was nothing that would prevent him continuing to serve as a minister. He elected to continue to stand aside, and so we've had an acting education minister in place since then. No one else has been sworn in as education minister. No one has gone to the Governor General. There have been no resignations. We've always been very clear about that. And should Mr Tudge wish to return, I certainly I, I know he will. And I look forward to him doing that.
As Tanya Plibersek pointed out, is he just conveniently not there on the front bench so he has a low profile in this campaign so the questions aren't being asked yeah. of him every single day? You know, it, it just... It, it looks like seem a, a, bit odd, doesn't a it? political solution that puts him in a halfway house until this election is over, Fran. Why don't we move on? Because the formalities needed to lock in this election for the 21st of May have all been carried out by now. Legal paperwork known as the writs have been issued by the Governor-General. That, in turn set up the end of the 46th Parliament. That happened this morning. It was done in full ceremonial tradition with a proclamation read on the forecourt, a 19-gun salute, and then all signed documents were promptly marched inside to go on display outside the entrance to the House of Representatives. Yep, so it's formally on, and ABC election analyst Anthony Green joins us now because he's the man who knows all about the numbers. Anthony, hello there. Good afternoon. Let's do a little bit of seat mathematics because it's important that we know at the beginning what we're going to need to know on the final night, election night. Anthony, how many seats does Labor need to win? How many seats does the government need to hold? And what would leave us in hung parliament territory? What are we going to be looking for on election night? How many seats? The, the redistribution abolished a Liberal seat in Perth, created a Labor seat in Melbourne. So the numbers are a one-seat shift from the last election. So Labor has 69 seats, the government has 76, and 76 is the minimum you needed for a majority government. Though I would note that one of those seats is currently represented by Craig Kelly, who's defected to the United Australia Party, but by convention you leave it with the party that won it at the last election. So the government has 76, Labor has 69, there are seven, uh, six seats on the crossbench. If the Labor wins four seats from Labor with no other change from the coalition, with no other changes, Labor has more seats in the coalition. If Labor wins seven seats from the coalition, Labor reaches majority government. Now, neither of those numbers take account of whether the coalition loses seats to independent, independents or Labor loses seat to Greens or there aren't many independents running in Labor seats. But those numbers, four for Labor to be the biggest seat, seven for Labor to be majority government, take no account of other seats changing hands with independents. And, of course, those numbers are net numbers. There could be pluses and minuses on both sides. Yeah. That could happen, Anthony. Now, we saw the leaders today, uh, Gilmore in New South Wales for Scott Morrison, Northern Tasmania for Anthony Albanese. As we cast across the map for the top seven or eight seats to be found. Geographically, is there any place that's, you know, richer in marginals to be swung either way? Yeah, I, I'm always amused why you have to talk to, a say, an apprentice in a marginal seat. You could talk to an apprentice in a, in a safe seat because they get the same money. It's just one of these things that people arrange for the, for the media. Now, there's nothing particularly specific about marginal seats. Marginal seats tend to be marginal because on the underlying political geography of a state, they draw boundaries, and sometimes those boundaries are drawn in such a way that the two major parties in a seat are roughly evenly divided. There aren't many seats which are marginal because they've got lots and lots of swinging voters. You get a little bit of that on the edges of capital cities where you've got more socially mixed electorates uh, and you've got lots of, say, young families buying houses. They're more... Um, affected by individual policies. You sometimes get seats like Hunter or Capricornia where underlying sort of political patterns are shifting because of differences in policies like climate change or tax policy. So sometimes individual policies call marginals, cause marginal seats. But ba for instance, Bass and Braddon are marginal because that's the way the geography works out. There's lots of Labor voting areas and Liberal voters areas and they tend to go backwards and forwards just around the national average. So uh, there's nothing peculiar about marginal seats other than they are marginal. Anthony, there's a lot of focus on some of the independents taking on particularly Liberal candidates in what have been Blue Ribbon Liberal seats around inner city Melbourne, inner city Sydney. Uh, this happened last time. Zali Segal, of course, won Warringah, but, but none of the others came up trumps then. Um, you've always cautioned against overstating independents' chances. I just want to bring up a shot of... This is the uh, shot from the campaign launch of the independent Zoe Daniel, who's taking on Tim Wilson in the Liberal seat of Goldstein. It uh, shows quite a crowd. Um, do you think the independents, do you see any independents who you would think on the numbers would have a real shot given this sort of kind of support that seems to be emerging for them? 
what's going on in these seats is a similar phenomenon to what's happening to the Labor votes in seats like Hunter and Capricornia. It's partisan dealignment that the traditional way that economics is addressed in politics is getting a bit out of alignment in some seats. There are lots of voters in these very affluent seats that are thinking there are other issues just than the main, main agenda which is running, which are important, like a corruption commission and climate change. So it's biting in those electorates in that way. What's, I think what's interesting was the sheer number of people there. Australia's political parties have been very heavily hollowed out in recent years. Uh, and trying to get thousands of people to work for a political party is pretty hard nowadays. So to see so many people turn out for an independence suggests there is a bit of momentum going on there and that there's a lot of people prepared to work for, for a candidate in that way. OK, Anthony, thank you very much. We look forward to talking to you through the campaign and can't wait for you to decode the numbers on the big night. Anthony Thank Green, our, elect, our election analyst. And, of course, the numbers who will be doing all the counting is the AEC. And this afternoon, the Electoral Commissioner, Tom Rogers, called by a government house to collect the paperwork he's required to hold throughout its campaign. And before he did that, friend Tom Rogers called by our very studio here in Par Parliament House for a chat. <laughs> Tom Rogers, welcome back to Afternoon Briefing. The date has been set, the 21st of May. Between now and then, have you ever had an election that spans quite so many public holidays in recent times? Uh, yes, we have, and thank you for inviting me back. In fact, the last election was virtually the same with Easter and Anzac Day and those sorts of issues that we had to work through then. And that doesn't increase cost unduly because staff are working on public holidays? Uh, it doesn't unduly increase cost. Obviously, any time there's a public holiday involved, it, it does involve some small increase, but we're prepared and we're ready and the staff are keyed up and they're raring to go. Now, what of the staff? Now that the starter's gun has been fired, as it were, have you fully stood up your workforce for this election? Not quite yet, but we've been running expressions of interest online. Uh, interestingly, it's be the biggest workforce we've ever hired, over 100,000 people, probably around about 105,000. At the moment, we've got over 200,000 expressions of interest for that uh, workforce, which uh, is great. Is that unusually strong? It is. Um, and uh, I'd still say, though, if you're keen to work for us, put your name on, jump on the website and have a look, because quite often where the numbers are are not exactly where you need those people, so there's always vacancies, and we'd be looking forward to working with them. All right, let's take it down to voters now. We have a deadline of mm. Easter Monday. That, that's a week from now to either update your details or enrol to vote. What do voters need to do in both of those categories and mm. how? Um, I'd urge people to jump online and to check their enrolments. It's easy to do on our website. And, in fact, it's already started. You won't be surprised that yesterday, in the first hour, we had 4,000 people uh, submit some sort of enrolment form, either an update or a new enrolment. 30,000 at the end of the day yesterday, and we're expecting 900,000 in the next seven-day period. So I'd urge people, jump on, make sure your enrolment is accurate if you've moved, uh, and just check. 900,000 is a, a large number. As you say, some of those are just updating, but on an electoral roll that stood at around 17 million, is it conceivable that we would hit 18 million this time around? Uh, no, I don't think it would be conceivable that we hit 18 million, but it's been a huge effort. I think we've put over a million people on the roll since the last election. We think by the end of the week we'll be at 97% completeness. And if I can just say we think that's a sort of modern democratic miracle. It really is globally best practice and it's fantastic. And I'd urge people to join that group as well. All right, so they've got a week to do that. Why don't we move on then to the next block of issues that you deal with, and that is postal voting. When can people ask for one? Do they need a good reason to get one? Hmm. There's a number of issues in that question. The first thing is I think that most Australians will still vote in person and on the day, and, and frankly, that's what we'd prefer. The Act is set up to require people to vote on the day unless there's a reason for them not to do it. So let me put that on the table to start with, and it'll be safe to do so. We've got all sorts of measures in the polling place to keep people safe. However, if they have a reason, they can apply for a postal vote, um, and they can apply right now. And the best way to do that is to jump onto the AEC's website and apply for a postal vote if you think you... Uh, entitled to do so. And why that? Why are you directing them directly to your site? Because I think they do have legitimate avenues to request through others, including political parties. And uh, not to denigrate any political party, because they're lawfully able to do that, I think 
the best thing that citizens can do if they wish to apply for a postal vote is to jump onto our website because it's quicker, it's secure, and I can guarantee that they'll be given a, they sent that postal vote. OK, just on the reasons, uh, a small snapshot of reasons that you might have to have to be eligible for a post. Uh, effectively, you can't attend a polling place on the day um, for a range of reasons. You're too far away or you're working in a range of other uh, measures. But the way we think of it is that you vote on the day. If you can't vote on the day, you vote in person pre-poll and then you postal vote after that. Even so, and even allowing for all the preparations you're putting into pre-poll and voting on the 21st of May, you must be reasonably f expecting or forecasting a rapid increase in postals. 8% three years ago, it's going to be higher. It absolutely is, and we're prepared for that increase. Um, but, but, of course, the more votes in envelopes, um, a simple thing, it's going to take us longer to determine a result at the other end. And again, the whole event is set up as a transparent community event, which is why we're encouraging people, if they're able to vote, to come into one of our polling places and vote. Now, in the event of a close election, uh, it will take time to get through mm. those postals. Would that have any implications for the Senate result? You have about five weeks here to crunch that result uh, by the 1st of July. Is there any threat that the AEC may not make that deadline? So you've raised a really interesting uh, constitutional issue. We're very aware of that and we have set up a process to make sure that we can absolutely return the writ in time for the Senate to, to sit and to mitigate those risks. Now, of course, it will be a high pressure uh, game, as it always is at election time, to get those votes counted. It's a huge task, but we're very, very confident we'll get that done. And, Commissioner, you will have by now received the writs from the Governor-General. We've heard a lot about them in recent days. Can you actually take us through what that document is? Well, His Excellency the Governor-General actually issues me a piece of paper that commands me to conduct an election. And it's that piece of paper I then take um, after the election, I then certify it by signing it and returning it to the Governor-General. And it's a very sort of archaic process. And, and that's the basis on which the election is run. And all the timings run off... Uh, off that ...the issuing of it and you physically returning it and the safe storage thereof. And I'm very conscious that that writ actually commands me personally and it names me to do a number of things. Um, and so the next few weeks is full on. Well, if you didn't already appreciate it, uh, great responsibility resting on your shoulders. Electoral Commissioner Tom Rogers, thanks for joining us again. Thank you very much. All right, well, each week throughout the campaign, Afternoon Briefing will be joined by two people who know an awful lot about politics, but particularly the trials and tribulations, Fran, of conducting election campaigns. They certainly do. Earlier I sat down with Labor's Craig Emerson. He co-chaired the review into Labor's 2019 election loss and also former Liberal MP Christopher Pine. <laughs> Craig Emerson, Christopher Pine, welcome to Afternoon Briefing. Thanks, Fran. Pleasure. You're both MPs of long experience, battle-hardened, I think we can safely say. What would an MP be feeling right now at this point, day one of a campaign? Christopher? Uh, I think a great sense of relief, actually, which sounds counterintuitive because they've now got six weeks to D-Day. But the worst part about being a candidate or a member is the, like, the last fortnight to a month where everybody knows when the election's going to be called, and, of course, they don't. Only the Prime Minister knows or the, uh, the Federal Director of the Liberal Party or the Labor Party in the case of Craig's party. So actually having the starter gun fired uh, and getting your posters up where you can actually do something to help yourself get re-elected is a big change to what you've been doing for the previous three years and it's great. And Craig? I think a level of nervousness, if I could use the sporting analogy, when a team runs on the field uh, for a big contest, uh, no one on either side is completely relaxed and saying, oh, this is fantastic. They you know, don't want to make errors. They want to make the most of it. They'd like to score a few points and they'd like to win. Ultimately, I agree with Christopher, though, that at least, you know, sitting in the dressing sheds, <laughs> if you like, um, you're waiting to get out there. And once you're out there, you go, right, this is it. It's real now. So what then, what happens to those nerves when your leader makes a gaffe on day one, as Anthony Albanese has done when he didn't know the unemployment rate? Well, this is, I suppose, clearing some cobwebs out. Uh, it's not unprecedented. Pretty big cobweb, isn't it? 
Well, it's not <laughs> unprecedented. The um, Liberal leader, when I was working for Bob Hawke, didn't know the size of the economy. Uh, Bob Hawke said to me, mate, get me all the key economic statistics. And I said, I think what I need to get you is the price of bread, price of milk um, and, and other grocery prices, price of petrol. So he went on to ABC 7.30 report and the first question was, Prime Minister, what's the price of a loaf of bread? And he said, oh, $2.30, whatever it was. So it's a matter of, you know, expecting the unexpected, I suppose, but, yes, yeah, clearing the cobwebs. Well, how bad a mistake is this one, though? I mean, for a leader to underestimate the size of the unemployment queues by, you know, somewhere between 150 and 200,000 people, I think, on my rough back-of-the-envelope reckoning. Oh, well, that's a good back of the envelope calculation, but um, he he did say he wasn't sure. Um, he had a stab at it. But shouldn't he have been sure? I it. mean, shouldn't someone have made him sure? And shouldn't well, he have course. been sure? Labor, the government's been talking about unemployment with a four in it for a long time. Well, of course, you know, being perfect would be terrific, but no one's going to run a perfect campaign. And that's really the way you manage anything that does involve not your best moment. Um, you can, and the, and the way to do that is to just get up and move on. I really fervently do not believe that this is going to alter the outcome of the 2022 federal election. Christopher, what do you think? Well, Fran, I think Craig's being generous because, of course, when Bob Hawke was the, was the leader running into that election and the leader of the opposition made that gaffe, Bob Hawke went on to win, uh, as Craig would remember, since Bob Hawke won every election that he ran for as Prime Minister. Um, look, it is a gaffe, it's a serious gaffe, uh, because the public are wanting to fill in the story on Anthony Albanese, and the first thing that they'll know is that he didn't know the unemployment rate, and yet he's been campaigning on the economy, uh, and it's a key statistic. It reminded me very much of uh, when John Howard was asked the price of a loaf of bread many years ago and didn't know the answer, and when Bill Shorten was asked how much uh, his environment policies would cost GDP. He didn't know the answer in the first week of the last campaign. So it's a stumble. Look, it's not catastrophic, but it's definitely a stumble. And uh, Anthony Albanese will be kicking himself because, and I'm not running for election, and I knew it was 4% as soon as somebody mentioned it to me. Uh, Anthony Albanese probably will be kicking himself, but it's a free kick for the government. I noticed that Scott Morrison didn't take it at the press conference this morning. Why do you think that was? Well, it speaks for itself. I mean, what we learned at the last election was that Scott Morrison is extremely laser-like focused on his messages of the day. And last election, when there were Labor candidates going off the rails for social media use of whatever it was, and I remember I was on the morning call every morning at 6 o'clock and people said we should take advantage of this or take advantage of that, Scott was very clear that we were focusing on one thing, uh, and that was the his leadership and the change and the economy, and he never deviated from it. And, I mean, one of the reasons that Labor are not completely certain they're going to win this election, despite the fact that they are miles ahead in the polls and the government is, a, is the underdog, is because Scott Morrison's shown himself to be a very adept campaigner and being focused on your message every day is very much part of that. Speaking of the polls, let me ask both of you, Christopher, I'll stay with you for this. Do you trust the polls right now? Look, I think the polls are very peculiar. I mean, I think when they're, when they're accurate, it's more of a fluke. Uh, in recent years, they've been more inaccurate than accurate. Now, some, you're going to get it right eventually, of course. You know, <laughs> if you have 100 stabs at it, you know, you'll probably get it right half a dozen times. But I don't trust the polls. Um, I think the only poll that really matters is Election Day, and I think a lot of voters... Uh, switched off, and of course, not even answering their phones, Fran. I mean, when was the last time you answered a phone call from a non identified phone number? I, I never do because people think it might be a scammer from Tunisia. They've got no idea. Okay, what about the polls? Let me go to your home state. The polls in Boothby, the polls published, and I understand private, have Labor a mile in front. Do you think Labor's going to win or the government's going to lose Boothby? Well, I think the, uh, the battle in Boothby and Sturt, for that matter, is reminding Liberal voters in what are two traditional Liberal seats, uh, what they're going to get if they change their voting patterns of a lifetime. Uh, I mean, it all sounds great before an election to have a protest vote, which, of course, the polls are only indicating at the moment people are angry with the government. But when an election's called, there's a reset. People actually have to think, what government do I want? Now, the majority of voters in Boothby and Sturt are Liberal voters. So the job of the Liberal campaign is to remind those people why they've voted Liberal in the past, 
on the economy and national security and leadership, and that they want to keep doing that in the future. And we're six weeks away from knowing whether that campaign's been successful or not, and that's a long time. Do you think Labor will win Boothby? Me? Yeah. Do you think they will? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I don't think they'll win Boothby <laughs> or Steve. All right. Uh, uh, Craig, what do you think about the polls? Uh, we had a good look at this, Jay Weatherall and I, after the 2019 election, and so did the pollsters, by the way, most of them, not all. Uh, the basic error in those polls was uh, the voters who really are so busy that they, as Christopher said, that they're very unlikely to pick up the phone. Now, a lot of people do pick up the phone, but if you've got a group who don't and they are going to vote one way, then you get a bias in the polls. That's what happened last time. Scott Morrison calls them the quiet Australians. We found that they were very busy people on the outer urban uh, fringes of the big cities and also in regional Australia. And they were actually intending to vote for the Liberal Party, Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party. That's why they got that wrong uh, last time. They have improved. And one good test, I think a very recent test, is a, a news poll uh, which uh, predicted or had a 54-46 result for the South Australian election, and the result was 54-46. So there has been improvement, but I can't put my hand on the heart, my heart and say, therefore, they are accurate. I'll tell you what will dominate through the whole period is there's about five of them now, and every time one comes out, there'll be this ooh and ah, and, and then, in fact, <laughs> I, even that, I don't think is going to change votes. Well, uh, what will change votes is, you know, the party that puts up the better proposition for the future of the country. As Christopher says, some of them have got to get it right sometime. Um, in your review, that, that post-election review you did with Jay Weatherall, uh, Craig Emerson, you said Labor's policies should be bold but should form part of a coherent Labor story. Has Labor done that? What's the coherent Labor story? Uh, well, I thought Anthony Albanese, uh, in his budget reply, encapsulated that uh, by what is talking... it? Well, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> um, he talked about Medicare, child care, aged care, labour cares. So that's in the, the, the whole social area. And, of course, in areas of climate change, labour has a very active policy that's been well accepted by the business community and will make a real difference. But fundamentally, it's about improving the living standards of the working people of this country. That is, improving the living standards of Australian working people, not just the, the, the employees, but also small businesses. And that's what needs to happen because real wages, after taking account of inflation, have stagnated and even the budget forecasts are for them not to recover until 2025. So, you know, frankly, I don't want to get into full advocacy here, but the people will need to have a look at a proposition that their wages will not catch up with inflation according to the budget's own forecasts until 2025. Okay. That's another election away. Okay, but you take out in the front page of your report was Labor's policies should be bold. The Prime Minister's going around saying that Labor's a blank page and Anthony Albanese is trying to sneak into office. Which is it? How much time have we got? Not Child long. Care. Not long, because Christopher's yeah, well, going to have well, a go. Then, well, and I'm, I'm obviously not going to agree with you, and I'll go through an integrity, you know, an anti-corruption commission, the three areas of care that I talked about. Uh, climate change is really important. There's a whole suite of policies. In fact, I count around 20 now. Last time there was over 200. Now, that was too many, and they were funded by big new taxes, so it became pretty scary what we said in the review was that Labor should come up with a set of signature policies to signify the sort of government that it would form. Now, you can't... Neither political party can say, this is what we'll do week to week, month to month. There was no pandemic before the 2019 election, so um, no party would okay. have been able to keep all those commitments. So a set of signature policies that signify the sort of government Labor would form. Uh, Christopher, is, if Labor's got a $5 billion childcare policy and a $2.5 billion aged care policy and a $1.5 billion skills policy, is that really a small target? With Scott Morrison well, having, having us on. It's interesting, Fran, though, because despite that list of, uh, of different policies, uh, Anthony Albanese hasn't managed to convince the voters that he's got them. Uh, and yet Scott Morrison's obviously finding that people are responding to the message that, that Labor is trying to sneak into office without having any policy, without being a blank page. So, I mean, perception is reality in politics. There's only six weeks to go, and yet Labor is still trying to convince people that they have got an agenda 
for the next three years and beyond. So I think that's a, that's been a failure of messaging in the last three years. Well, who does this benefit, though? I mean, if if, if Anthony Albanese has a low recognition rate, his um, and Scott Morrison's unpop unpopular in the community, which all the polls and plenty of Liberals seem to suggest that he is, do you both think this will still be a presidential style campaign? And and who wins that contest, Christopher? Well, it depends. You see, I think Scott Morrison is now a very known quantity. He's been prime minister for almost four years. Uh, if the Labor Party can fill in the blanks with Anthony Albanese in a way that benefits him, then they will win. If the Liberal Party can position Anthony Albanese the way they want to position him and fill in the blanks for Labor, uh, then the Liberal Party will win, the coalition will win. So it's really too early to say how Anthony Albanese will be perceived. Uh, I think from Labor's point of view, the fact that it's even still an issue who Anthony Albanese is, uh, is an interesting paradigm. I mean, it's the opposite to Bill Shorten in 2019, where people had formed a very clear view about Bill, whether it was fair or unfair. Uh, with Anthony, they're yet to form that view, and I think that's an opportunity for both Labor and Liberal. Yeah, Craig, could that be an opportunity for Labor, given that, um, you know, the, the Bill factor in your report was a significant factor? Um, if given Labor's keen to keep the focus on the Prime Minister and the issues of, you know, he can't be trusted, that sort of thing, could it be... Do you think it's a liability or a plus, Anthony Albanese's well, low recognition I rate? Well, I don't accept the proposition, the, the low recognition... How could a guy who has a low recognition rate be the preferred Prime Minister over Scott Morrison in several of the polls and just behind in the other polls? I mean, people do know who Anthony Albanese is and they do favour the Medicare, aged care, child care, the better climate change policy, uh, uh, real policies to deal with the fact that wages are not keeping up with inflation. I mean, these are the core issues. And, you know, it, it's inconceivable that you can have the proposition that Anthony Albanese is very competitive or ahead as preferred Prime Minister against the proposition that no-one knows who he is. My goodness, if they do, if that's true and they do get to know who he is, he's going to win very, very easily, thank you very much. You think if they get to know him, they're going to get to like him? Well, of course. You know, he, he barracks for the South Sydney Rabbitohs. I mean, I'll forgive him for that. I barrack for the Bulldogs. We're at the bottom of the table. They're somewhere in the middle. Uh, he said to me and he said to a lot of people, he believes in... Uh, his mother taught him to believe in three things, the South Sydney Rabbitohs, the Australian Labor Party and the Catholic Church. So, you know, he's got a, a set of core beliefs. I, I will not profess that um, Anthony is a practising Catholic, but he does have a set of values okay. that guide all of his decision-making and, and views. What do you think, Christopher? Do you think the more they get to know Anthony Albanese, the more they're going to like him? Oh, look, I, it remains to be seen. I'm not going to pass judgment on Anthony's character. He and I are very good friends. We were leader of the House and managed opposition business together for many, many years. Do you like him? I think that's, I think that's very well known. I like Anthony. He likes me. Uh, do I want him to be the Prime Minister? No. Uh, would he want me to be the Prime Minister? No. <laughs> um, the, the Australian I, voter I've will decide... I've got you at 50 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> the Australian voter will decide uh, who the leader should be based on what the policies are going to be for them, and it'll be, in the end, a election about the economy, keeping it strong in uncertain times and in uncertain national security times, whether it's cyber or okay. defence or borders, they'll make a decision about that. OK, well, you're both going to join us regularly through the campaign, which is terrific, but let me just ask each of you for briefly, if you can, this last uh, question, because we've seen Scott Morrison on the ukulele, we've seen Anthony Albanese <laughs> DJing. Do you think we're going to see the leaders doing more of this sort of thing in this campaign, or, or are they going to play it safe? Craig? Oh, look, I don't think uh, people want uh, the politicians to play it safe. Um, you know, uh, I wouldn't recommend singing based on my own past experience, but... <laughs> I remember. I, I, I remember too. Well. No, no one can forget. Um, but the point is, people surely want a bit of colour in an election campaign. This is a six-week marathon. And can I just finally pay tribute to Christopher and Anthony for the way they did 
uh, operate in the previous parliaments when Anthony was leader of government business and and Christopher of leader of opposition uh, in, uh, the opposition leader in the house of, of, of opposition business or parliamentary business they did work very very well together and that's just an indication of the experience I think that Anthony Albanese has he's a former pri uh, deputy prime minister and he was an infrastructure minister key cabinet okay. minister for six six uh, years Christopher what do you think more ukulele well, I think less vaudeville, more policy is always a good thing, actually. I think the only mistake that, that Craig made was not having a staff or pulling out the plug on his uh, Yui boom when, um, when he was singing <laughs> his, uh, his Skyhook song I, back in, I, in those days. I met the cameraman the other day when I was doing another ABC program and he said, you were terrible. Scarred. And I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> less vaudeville, more scarred. policy. Christopher, you surprised me. Thank you, both of you. We'll see you back again soon. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. No, great chat. And by my reckoning, Fran, a lot of accumulated political insight there. Between the two of them, Christopher Pine and Craig Emerson, probably about half a century. 26 and 15, what's that up to? Yeah, all right, getting close 41. to half a century. Uh, great to hear that they'll be coming back on afternoon briefings throughout the campaign. Why don't we mop up some of the points you discussed there and, indeed, of the day. Uh, clearing out the cobwebs is their uh, description of, um, of Anthony Albanese's gaffe to today and uh, a stumble but not catastrophic. Yeah, I was struck by that. I mean, Christopher Pine's been in politics for 26 years. He's been around the campaigns. He's been very close to the leaders through a lot of that, especially all those years he was in Cabinet. For him to judge this as a, as a stumble, not catastrophic, I think is probably good news for Anthony Albanese because I think Christopher Pine's instincts are probably pretty good. As you said earlier, it's happened on day one. Yeah. It gives Albanese plenty of time, really, to try and get his footing. No, no one, even the most ardent Labor supporter, would uh, want to think that uh, that this was the you know, devastating or the end of the campaign for anyone, even if it gaff had occurred on no, the No, but side. it goes to Christopher Pine's point, too, about, you know, the challenge for both parties is to fill in Anthony Albanese. And if, yep. if Labor lets um, Scott Morrison do that through stumbles like this, it just feeds that narrative that Scott Morrison's trying to say, which is don't take a risk on Labor because they're not ready, they're not up for it. Yep, policy light, or to use Christopher Pine's phrase, you know, less vaudeville, more policy is uh, what he'd be looking forward to. I'm not sure we realistically can, Fran. It's almost as if most of the major offerings are already out there. There. We didn't get much today, did we? No, we're going to labour through days where there's not much more than than the character assault, which is a key part of campaigning. Oh, but let's hope so. I mean, Labor's still... That pitch there of Labor's childcare, uh, Medicare and aged care, we haven't actually seen the Medicare offering, so they've presumably got something big there still sorry. to come. Yep. And just finally, polls. Uh, you know, lengthy discussion there, but why don't we bring our own analysis to it? Uh, no great shift in the two-party preferred, but there's been some erosion of Labor's all important primaries. Yeah, the government's pointing to this Labor's poll, uh, primary vote according to news poll has dropped four points in three weeks. That's quite a drop. Uh, the government's sort of claiming that's off the back of the, the cost of living budget. They got a bit of a bounce, they like to claim. Whatever it is, I'm sure Labor is watching that primary vote very, very closely because yep. their primary vote last time at the election was 33%. To no, vote. woeful. And there'll be a slew of them. I guess drawing a trend line through all of them will be the trick throughout this campaign, noting what happened last time. Well, Fran, I think you've got a plane to catch back to Sydney. You'll, of course, be joining us uh, each day this week, excluding Good Friday. I think we might take a well-earned day off then. But uh, we're going to farewell, Fran, uh, from our own studio here in Parliament, hoping that you can get back here personally uh, again with us before this campaign is out. That's it from us for Afternoon Briefing today. Back again tomorrow at the same time to wrap up the events of Campaign Day 2. See you then.